Let's see. No bugs. No musical numbers. I ain't never know with these critters, but you know, throughout this look back, we have seen several artists that know how to make a name of themselves by simply using the artist stop motion. We saw how Ray Harryhausen, who brought to life some of the biggest and most iconic monsters in cinema history. We saw how Will Vinton revolutionized commercials by giving us unforgettable characters that subtly tell us to buy stuff. We saw how Ardman turned into UK's most finest and most beloved animation studio, and we saw how Tim Burton, who turned his dark and twisted imagination into its own art style. And then there's this guy. But like Burton, he doesn't have a lot of animated films under his belt, but is known to be the quintessential filmmaker who can tell an amazing story by simply using stop motion. This is Henry Selleck. Born on November 30th, 1952 in Glenridge, New Jersey, Henry Selleck was always fascinated with the world of animation since he was a kid. Movies like The Adventures of Prince Ahmed and Ray Harryhausen's The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad would always inspire the little Henry to always draw whenever he can. After studying in Rutgers University, Syracuse University, and Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design, he finally went to Cal Arts to study animation. This resulted in him being nominated for a Student Academy Award for his project like Phases and Tube Tales. Once that was done, he went on to work at Disney to work as a trainee for projects led by animation legend Don Bluth, like the short The Small One and the animation for Pete's Dragon. It wasn't until a few years later when he managed to become a full animator in the 1981 film The Fox and the Hound. After staying at Disney, he went to do some freelance work and even a few projects of his own. Some of these include his short Sea Page, commercials for Pillsbury and Ritz Crackers, storyboarding for films like Return to Oz and Nutcracker the Motion Picture, and a bunch of logo animations for MTV. It wasn't until 1990 when he met up with a good friend of his from Disney, Tim Burton, that he ended up getting his first directing gig on a project of Burton's, The Nightmare Before Christmas. This was mostly because Tim couldn't do it since he was too busy working on other films like Batman Returns. After the massive critical acclaim of Nightmare, Disney immediately got Henry to go to work on another stop-motion animated film, James and the Giant Peach. It's the story of James, who had to live with his evil aunt because an angry rhino suddenly came out of nowhere and ate his parents. No, seriously, that's what the movie literally says. An angry rhinoceros appeared out of nowhere and gobbled up his poor mother and father. See? Anyways, after James was offered some... Crocodile tongues. Tongues? One thousand long, slimy crocodile tongues, boiled in the skull of a dead witch for twenty days and twenty nights. Add the fingers of a young monkey, the gizzard of a pig, the beak of a parrot, and three spoonfuls of sugar. Stew for a week and then let the moon... <laughs> Do the rest. Uh, yeah, let's go with that. And accidentally made a giant peach with it, he and his new giant bug friends get out of the aunt's house and head out to New York City. The concept of a James and the Giant Peach movie actually took about 12 years to finally made it to the big screen, most of which was spent to confront the movie's biggest obstacle, Roald Dahl, the author of the original book it was based on. You see, Dahl is actually pretty well known for not only writing such classic books like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Matilda, and many more, but also he's known to have a passionate hate for the movies adapted from his works. Heck, the guy doesn't even like Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory! The only film on record that he actually liked that was based on one of his books is the animated BFG. In other words, Roald Dahl is kind of known to be a prick in the film industry. However, a few years after his death on November 23rd, 1990, his widow, Lissy Dahl, decided to give the rights to Disney to go and produce this movie, and, like I said earlier, the people at Disney went to get Henry Selleck to direct the film, who was fresh out of The Nightmare Before Christmas. Of course, like many adaptations, there are several notable changes the movie did from the original book. 
Some of these include giving the rhino a much bigger role as the symbolism of James' fears, keeping the aunts alive at the end, replace the cloud men with skeleton pirates, just to name a few. And that doesn't include how the movie changed the personality of the characters. Originally, Andy Partridge was supposed to write the songs for the movie. But after he backed out because he didn't like his end of the bargain, he was replaced by Randy Newman. However, some time later, Andy did go and release the demos of his songs he originally made for the film. Also, Henry originally wanted the film to be either all stop motion or James to be a live actor throughout the whole movie, but ultimately decided to be a mix of both live action and animation just to be a little easier on the budget. This is actually the first and only movie role that Paul Terry, who played James, ever did. After he was bitten by the spider in this scene, he said that he never wanted to act again. Today, Paul is settling his life as a math teacher and being a part of the band, and possibly having a bad case of arachnophobia. This is the first time in a Disney film where someone has both a live action role and a voice for an animated character in the same film, which in this case is Miriam Margolis, who played both Aunt Sponge and the Glow Worm, since the 1946 Songs of the South where James Baskett played Uncle Remus and provided the voice of Br'er Fox. The design of the film was based on the works of children's book illustrator Lane Smith, who actually worked on a version of Roald Dahl's original book. In fact, Lane was hired as a conceptual designer for the film. Other works he worked on include Pixar's Monsters, Inc. and Ron Howard's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Of course, in the skeleton pirate scene, people would easily notice that the captain is actually Jack Skellington from The Nightmare Before Christmas. But few people would actually know that one of his shipmates is actually the living skeleton of Donald Duck. Seriously, the more you look at it, the more it becomes unmistakable. When it was released on April 12, 1996, the movie went really well with critics, saying that the arresting and dynamic visuals, offbeat details, and light-as-air storytelling makes James and the Giant Peach solid family entertainment. In fact, Lizzie Dahl said that Roll would have been delighted with what they did with James. It is a wonderful film. Uh, <laughs> um, no offense, lady. I understand that he was your husband and you still love him today, but um, something tells me that if he couldn't get through this then chances are he wouldn't have appreciated this either. As for the box office, it really doesn't look that good, only making about $29 million domestically. On the bright side, it did get nominated for an Oscar for Best Music, Original Musical or Comedy Score, and it won the top prize at the Annecy International Animated Film Festival. Several years after James and the Giant Peach, Henry came back once again to blend both live action and the crazy world of stop motion with Monkey Bone. It's about Stu, a famous cartoonist that created a cartoon monkey called Monkey Bone, is ready to launch a Monkey Bone TV series along with marrying his fiancée. Suddenly, Stu was caught in a freak accident that landed him in a coma while his conscious mind goes to downtown, the place where people wait to either live or die from their coma. Not only that, but downtown is also the home of fictional characters like Monkey Bone, who turns out to be the cartoon version of Conker from Conker's Bad Fur Day, and he decided to live in the body of Stu. Now with the help of a cat girl named Kitty, Stu must get back to his real body before Monkey Bone really screws up his life. The movie was based on a comic book named Dark Town, which was written by Kaya Blackley and illustrated by Vanessa Chung. How it ended up as a movie is that a member of the San Francisco animation community was a huge fan of the comic and gave one to one of Henry Selick's producers, Denise Rotina, for her to give to Henry. Selick loved the comic so much that he decided to make it his quest to get the rights. He even wrote a letter to Kaya saying, I've never felt any project was closer to my sensibilities than this one. It was originally going to stay really true to the source material, but as time moved on, the project went into a completely different direction, becoming the film you see today. There were several different actors that were considered to be in this movie, but ended up being replaced by someone else. Like, Nicolas Cage was supposed to be Stu, but now it's Brendan Fraser. 
Christopher Walken was supposed to be Death, but then the part got taken by Whoopi Goldberg, and Monkey Bone was supposed to be voiced by Ben Stiller, but because he was too busy working on Mystery Men, he was replaced by John Turturro. Also, Stephen King was supposed to make a cameo, but because he was unavailable for shooting, he was replaced by a lookalike John Bruno. When it was released on February 23rd, 2001, it was a major disaster, like almost to the point that it's no longer funny. It got some pretty bad reviews saying that although original and full of bizarre visuals, Monkey Bone is too shapeless of a movie, with unengaging characters and random situations that fail to bring up laughs. What's even worse is that the movie became a total bomb, only earning $7.6 million worldwide. And by the way, this movie apparently has a budget of $75 million. Just the fact that a big budget movie released after the new millennium couldn't get eight digits on its box office number is something that I don't even know if I should laugh at or feel sorry for the film. After Monkey Bone, some people would think that Henry went on a little hiatus. Actually, he was still working, just not as the head of a big project. He went on to work on the stop motion of the 2004 Wes Anderson film, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. After that, he got himself a new job as a supervising director at the newly established Leica, which was previously Will Vinton Studios. While there, he went on to direct his first computer animated project, Moon Girl, in 2005, and then got back to work on a feature film with Coraline, which is about a girl that shares the name of the title who just moved to a new house and is not so happy about it, missing her old home and her friends. While exploring the house, she discovers a secret door that takes her to an alternate universe where she has the perfect parents, the best neighbors, and an awesome house. But soon she discovers that this could be too good to be true to her, since it involves a deadly catch. The idea all started when Henry Selleck met author Neil Gaiman. Neil was such a huge fan of The Nightmare Before Christmas that he wanted him to make a film adaptation of his book that he was close to finishing, Coraline. Henry loved the book so much that he decided to join in and immediately write a screenplay for it. However, there was a bit of a catch to it. Considering that the book was short to the point that he could only make about a 47 minute film, he extended some parts to give more detail and created a new character for Coraline to interact with, YB. Originally, the movie was supposed to be a musical with songs written by the band There Might Be Giants, but then the production was changed to make it more of a darker feature, so they took out all but one of the songs, which is the other father's song that he sings on the piano. According to the dialogue, Don French was playing Miss Spink, and Jennifer Sauters was Miss Forcible. Henry didn't like what he was hearing, so he decided to switch the roles between the two, which resulted in something that's more satisfying. For the look of the film, Henry wanted a more unique look, something that would match the dark and out of this world tone. So he got Japanese illustrator Tadahiro Uesugi to be the concept artist. A little note to add is that Uesugi's artwork is inspired by American advertising of the 50s and 60s. What was considered the hardest thing to design was actually the first they did, Coraline herself. It wasn't easy to try to make a girl that has the right amount of feistiness and curiosity. But when they did settle with a design, it was easy sailing with the rest, since they were modeled around Coraline. As for her puppets, they made about 28 different ones of the main character and each took 10 people 3 to 4 months just to make one. This movie actually holds several records, which I'll each talk about as I continue this, including the most stages deployed during production for a stop motion animated film. That means they were able to film 52 different scenes at the same time. Leica even hired students from the Art Institute of Portland to help out the crew. For the garden scene, the crew had to make 15 different sets of the whole garden, some of which are even duplicates. 
In order to make all the flowers blossom at the same time, the animators would work on just one big flower over a green screen with mirrors showing all the different angles, then the flowers were added by the visual effects team. Speaking of effects, the movie mixes practical and digital effects in order to keep that sense of what they see is real. Some of these include the fire was made by hand-drawn animation, and the fog was just dry ice that was later added digitally. But going on to the records, this is marked as the first stop-motion animated film to feature a morphing scene with the other mother, and it's also the first stop-motion animated feature made in 3D. The way they accomplished this was that they normally take a shot of a frame, but then a special machine would move the camera just a bit to take the same shot, resulting in two pictures that show the perspective of the left and right eye. Another record it holds is that this is also, as of 2015, the longest stop-motion animated film running at 100 minutes. When it was released on February 6, 2009, the movie brought back the fame of Henry Selick as a success. It received great reviews saying that with its vivid stop-motion animation combined with Neil Gaiman's imaginative story, Coraline is a film that is both visually stunning and wondrously entertaining. It also did pretty well at the box office with more than $75 million domestically and almost $125 million worldwide. This movie would go on to get nominated for tons of awards, including a Golden Globe, a BAFTA, and an Oscar for Best Animated Feature, and would win three Annies for Best Music, Best Character Design, and Best Production Design. After the release of Coraline, things seemed to look really good for Henry. In 2010, he made a deal with Disney and Pixar to go and make a few more stop-motion animated films for them with the theme of making them a family horror flick. Two of the movies they wanted Selick to make was a project called The Shadow King, then followed by a film based on another Neil Gaiman novel, The Graveyard Book. But then suddenly, on August 2012, things went horribly wrong. After reportedly spend 50 million dollars and The Shadow King was way behind schedule in production, Disney put the project to a halt and Selick left the company. But don't feel too bad for Henry, his future actually looks pretty good. He still owns the rights to The Shadow King and who knows, as you're watching this right now he might have actually made the movie. Also, he is following the footsteps of filmmakers like Brad Bird and is going into the transition to also make live-action films. <laughs>